Live NFL trivia every Tuesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge and have a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. When you give a head coach an extension, you are saying, I love the job that you've done for our organization so far. You gave the keys of the franchise to the coach, trusted him to win games and develop the players. And he did that. You have faith that he is going to take your team to the next level and build upon what you've already got going. In other words, the coach has to do something that deems him worthy of getting an extension. When he gets this extension without doing anything, it looks ridiculous. And when he gets this extension and gets fired two months after said extension, it looks even more ridiculous. If you give a coach that continuously loses games an extension, and then said coach continues to lose games to the point where you fire him two months later, you look like an idiot. What did you think was going to happen? Yet in 1976, that's exactly what happened with the Atlanta Falcons and head coach Marion Campbell. In the middle of the preseason during August, Campbell got a contract extension. In October, Campbell got relieved of his duties. And this is the story behind the stupidest coaching contract in the history of the Atlanta Falcons. Before I talk about the actual contract, we need some context to understand the head coach in question, why he got the job, and how he even stayed on long enough to get an extension in the first place. Our story begins on November 3rd, 1974 when the 2-5 and five Atlanta Falcons were taking on the Miami Dolphins at the Orange Bowl. The game was a disaster. Miami won 42-7, and the Falcons looked terrible in just about every facet of the game. After the game, head coach Norm Van Brocklin threatened to fight every single reporter in attendance, which did not go over too well with the higher-ups. Van Brocklin, who had been the head coach of the team since 1968, was fired the very next day. I went in-depth about this incident a while ago, so if you want to learn more about everything that happened, then click the card in the upper right corner. But without Van Brocklin in charge, the Falcons needed a new head coach. Enter Marion Campbell, who had been the defensive coordinator of the Falcons since 1969. Say what you want about Campbell's head coaching abilities, because trust me, there is a lot to talk about there. But the man knew how to coach a defense, and his defenses in Atlanta consistently ranked in the top half of the league. He seemed like a worthy guy to finish up the season, and at least have a shot at being the man in charge. The season was already lost, as the Falcons were 2-6, so it's not like the 1974 season could get much worse with him in charge, right? Well, not quite, because the Falcons were absolutely atrocious over their final six games. Over those six games, they never scored more than 10 points, and they got shut out twice. The Falcons scored 34 points with Campbell as their head coach, or an average of 5.6 points per game, for some perspective on how bad that is. If you scored one touchdown a game, even if you missed the extra point, you're more likely than not to beat the Falcons. The Falcons had an awful 1-5 record in the six games under Campbell with a lone win being a 10-3 victory against the Green Bay Packers on the final day of the season. In that stretch, the Falcons got outscored by 87 points, or an average of 14.5 points per game. Back in 1974, since there was no two-point conversion, this meant that the Falcons were losing games under Campbell by an average of three possessions. Campbell was a welcome change of pace after the antics of Norvan Brocklin, which included wide receiver Al Dodd quitting the team after Van Brocklin wouldn't let him miss practice, even though his wife was about to give birth. They had two completely different styles. But even though the players seemed to respect Campbell, they weren't getting any results, or anything even resembling such. But owner Rankin Smith decided that Campbell deserved another shot in 1975, and needed a full year under his belt. That did not go so well. Even though the Falcons held a search for their next head coach, one month after the 1974 season ended, they named Campbell the full-time coach. Maybe with a chance to implement his system, and with the number one pick in the draft allowing them to get Steve Barkowski to bolster that offense, and hopefully become the first real franchise quarterback, things would get better and Campbell could lead a winning team. It's what the Falcons tried when they made Norv Van Brocklin the full-time head coach in 1969, after he was a not-so-good interim head coach in 1968. And much like Van Brocklin, this did not work out at first. The 1975 season looked like it might start off with some promise after a 2-2 two -two start, with two straight wins to start off the month of October where they allowed just 10 points combined. But after that, the wheels on the bus fell off. Atlanta lost five straight games to drop from 2-2 two two to 2-7, two going from a decent shot at the postseason to no hope whatsoever. And there were quite a few lowlights in that stretch. You had a 23-7 loss to the New Orleans Saints where the Falcons turned the ball over six times. You had a 16-7 loss to the Los Angeles Rams, which easily could have been a shutout, as the Rams led 16-0 late in the fourth quarter before the Falcons got a garbage-time touchdown. And the worst game of them all, without a doubt, was their game at Metropolitan Stadium against the Minnesota Vikings, who were undefeated. In that atrocity of a game, the Vikings won 38-0. Atlanta had six first downs and 60 yards of total offense, and turned it over eight times. And starting quarterback Kim McQuilkin had one of the worst games ever. 
this has to be up there with one of the worst games a quarterback has ever played in NFL history. He went 5 for 26 with 43 yards passing, completing 19.2% of his passes. Add up the three sacks, and the Falcons had 17 net passing yards. And of course, he threw for no touchdowns and five interceptions, finishing with a passer rating of 0, 0.0, which is worse than if he did nothing but spike the ball into the ground on every single play. Atlanta finished the season with a 4-10 record, and finished in the bottom half of the league in just about every major statistical category. Excluding the New Orleans Saints, who were 2-12, the Falcons had the worst record of any team in the NFC. Still, despite the poor season, Marion Campbell was not going to lose his job. Even though the Falcons were 5-15 in 20 games under Campbell's watch, winning a mere 25% of the time, Rankin Smith was not going to fire Campbell. So at this point, you might be thinking that he'll give him a vote of confidence and say that he'll be the head coach for the 1976 season. However, Smith didn't do that. For some inexplicable reason, he went one step further. When the 1976 preseason began, Campbell was still there, patrolling the Atlanta sidelines. And after the first three preseason games, back when teams actually cared about wins and losses, and where coaches could legitimately lose their jobs for poor preseason performances, the Falcons were winless. After a 17-10 loss to Washington, a 31-7 loss to New England, and a 17-3 loss to the expansion Tampa Bay Buccaneers, which was the first competition that the Bucs ever won, the Falcons were 0-3. Combined with their poor play in recent years, including the 1975 season, and a lot of people were starting to panic, or just get ready for the prospect of another horrible season. Everyone felt that way. That is, everyone except owner Rankin Smith. Because off the heels of that preseason loss to the Buccaneers, Smith, for some reason, decided to give Campbell a contract extension. Said Smith on the move, I don't hit panic buttons. If we don't win, I'll take my lumps just like everyone else. To me, this quote makes no sense. Yes, I completely understand not wanting to panic, and I completely understand not wanting to fire Campbell just yet. But it's not panicking if you don't give him a contract extension. That's just the normal thing to do. You giving him a contract extension is the equivalent of throwing money at the Titanic to redecorate the ballroom while the ship is going down from the collision with the iceberg. It just doesn't make any sense. And yes, we've seen coaches get extensions before without necessarily doing anything to warrant them. In 1964, Tom Landry got a 10-year extension as the head coach of the Dallas Cowboys, even though the Cowboys never had a winning record under Landry, and weren't exactly improving on a year-to-year -year basis in the early 60s. That obviously worked out very well for Dallas. But if Rankin Smith was trying to do what the Cowboys did a decade prior, it wasn't working. It also helped when at the press conference announcing this extension, Smith said, I gave him an extension, and I'm glad I did. The justifications that Smith gave for extending Campbell had nothing to do with football or stats or anything like that. The two justifications given were I don't like to panic, and giving the extension made me happy. There is no possible way whatsoever that this could backfire. There is no way that a 5-15 head coach getting a contract extension will look like a horrible move in hindsight, right? To the surprise of everyone except Rankin Smith, this extension was laughably bad. When I say nothing went right for the Falcons to start off the 1976 season, I truly mean that. Nothing went right. It started in Week 1 with a 30-14 loss at home to the division rival Los Angeles Rams. In a game where the Falcons, after allowing just 6 points in the first half and going into the intermission with the lead, allowed 24 points in the second half, with Steve Barkowski getting sacked 5 times and the team turning the ball over 4 times. That was followed up in Week 2 with a 24-10 loss to the Detroit Lions, where the Falcons led 10-0 entering the fourth quarter, only for the Lions to score 24 unanswered. That's two games to start off the season that the Falcons blew a second-half lead, and completely collapsed down the stretch. Guess it runs in the family. Even though the Falcons won their next game, winning 10-0 against the Chicago Bears in Week 3, they fell back to reality in Week 4, as they took on the Philadelphia Eagles at home. Atlanta led 13-7 in the fourth quarter, but once again they could not seal the deal, as Mike Barella hit Charlie Smith on a 9-yard touchdown pass in the fourth to give the Eagles a 14-13 victory. It also didn't help that Atlanta turned it over twice and had 95 yards of total penalties, and that kicker Nick Mickemeyer missed a field goal, but I digress. The good news in Week 5 was that they didn't blow the game. The bad news was that they never had a chance to blow it, as the New Orleans Saints were in complete control, winning it by a final score of 30 to nothing. Atlanta finished the game with 7 turnovers, and picked up just 68 net passing yards on 36 passing plays, completing 11 passes and taking 5 sacks. And after the shutout loss, owner Rankin Smith knew what he had to do. Two months after giving Marion Campbell that contract extension, and two months after going way overboard to prove to everyone that he was going to be the head coach of the Falcons for the foreseeable future, Smith fired Campbell. Smith said that this was a sad day, and called the decision to fire Campbell the most difficult decision of his life. 
The two were close friends, and the decision probably hurt Smith more than it hurt Campbell. But just like that, two months after that contract extension, Campbell was gone. After Campbell got fired five games into the 1976 season, he was replaced by general manager Pat Pepler, who adamantly stated that he wanted nothing to do with the head coaching position and admitted that he was in no way qualified to take over the job. I went in-depth about how the rest of the Falcon season went, as well as Pepper's bizarre but somewhat surprisingly successful tenure as the team's head coach, if you want to learn more about that by clicking the card in the upper right corner. The short version of it all, however, is that the Falcons once again finished the 1976 season with a 4-10 record, and the Falcons would hire a brand new head coach in 1977 when they got Lehman Bennett to take over the position. One thing that Smith said about Campbell is that he would have no problem landing another job in the NFL, and he was right about that. Campbell became the defensive coordinator of the Philadelphia Eagles in 1977, and in six seasons as the team's defensive coordinator, led the team to a top 10 defense five times. In 1980 and 81, Philadelphia finished with the best defense in football, and Campbell played a big role in helping the Eagles get to Super Bowl 15 during that 1980 season, which was their first appearance in franchise history. After Dick Vermeil retired, Campbell became the head coach of the Eagles for three years, but he didn't do anything and got fired in 1985. And then Campbell came back to Atlanta, becoming the team's defensive coordinator in 1986, and then becoming the head coach again in 1987, lasting three seasons with the team before being let go midway through the 1989 season. There are some guys that are built to be great coordinators but horrible head coaches, and it's safe to say that Marion Campbell was one of them. But a word of advice about this whole situation to any owners or general managers watching this video, if you have a coach that is losing games and you want to keep him in the hopes that they turn it around, that's fine, knock yourselves out. But please, for the sake of your fan base and your own wallet, do not unnecessarily give them a contract extension. Because if you do, you're going to look just as foolish as Rankin Smith did in 1976. Get your official Jaguar Gator 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Monday and Tuesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed out to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at JRGator9 and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters who help you on the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.